not all pain and agony. I would, I'd say 90% of the time we're really out there enjoying it, you know, the physical exercise and, the, and seeing the country and uh, just the whole experience. It's so much of a shared feeling. It's a wonderful experience to share it with my husband because it's a feeling that we'll have forever and ever. Hello everyone, I'm Brad Steinke, and during the next half hour, you'll be a witness to a most incredible human endeavor, the crossing of America on a tandem bicycle. Susan Notarangelo and Lon Haldeman, regarded as the top ultramarathon cyclists in America, set out to make the journey on Saturday, April 12th. They were out to beat their own record, set in 1983, of 10 days, 20 hours, and 23 minutes. Their first record was achieved just after they were married, despite delays caused by an illness that put Susan in a hospital and heat stress that forced the crew to dunk Lawn in an ice bath in order to lower his temperature. This year, they were out to beat that record, but more importantly, the 1986 attempt was to help fellow ultramarathoner Wayne Phillips a Canadian who was nearly killed by a hit-and-run driver outside of Tucumcari, New Mexico in the 1985 race across America. Phillips was left for dead and is now paralyzed from his chest down. Lon and Sue hoped their record attempt would help Phillips' recovery and rehabilitation, a process that will take a long time and cost a great deal of money. I think Wayne can handle the, the trauma to his body and the trauma to his mental self but how could any individual handle a $100,000 recovery bill from a hospital that wasn't even his fault? Two days before the start of the crossing, Lon and Sue gathered with their crew of nine, mapping out strategy and organizing the equipment and supplies that would fill their three support vehicles. There would be three tandem cycles for the trip, each one suited for special conditions. A trip like this needs plenty of tires. 50 were taken, 10 would be used along with eight wheels, six different seats, and dozens of other necessities, like lights, water bottles, and plenty of clothing. When all was in order, the crossing began at four o'clock in the morning in Huntington Beach, California. I want you to take this because there's 50 bucks to the Wayne Phillips Trust Fund in there. Okay. The deal is this, when you get to the other side, I'll give you another 50 for Wayne Phillips. If you bust your old time, if you break your old record, I'll give you 100. Oh, this is great. Okay. Great. Thank is it you. cash? All right. can go out and do that first 400 miles in 24 hours and after that then it's then you're tired and you're broken in well and you just just keep going Ron and Sue pedaled their way through a Southern California dawn and as the suburbs of Los Angeles went past one by one, their escort of well-wishers began to thin out. I think we ended up doing the first 100 miles in about 5 hours, 33 minutes, something like that. Near Palm Springs, California, high, hot winds gave the riders an extra and welcome push. But the Volkswagen van, which was usually the main support vehicle, had to stop and retrieve its broken CB antenna, just the first of numerous minor inconveniences that would become a part of the transcontinental record attempt. Later that afternoon, only one cyclist was left to provide company for Lon and Sue. Pete Penn Sears, the winner of the 1984 race across America and a good friend of the couple. 
He rode with him 250 miles to Quartzsite, Arizona. Just a typical weekend ride for an ultramarathoner. Near Blythe, California, the crew members were once again delayed, this time to fix a flat tire from the Volkswagen. But Lon and Sue were oblivious to the problem and kept pedaling, rolling into the first of many long and lonely nights. speeds right now of 35 and before we were hitting 40, 45 coming down the mountain. And if the disc had gone out, they would have crashed. After the first full day of riding, Lon and Sue had conquered their first goal, covering 415 miles in 24 hours. But it was a pace they knew they couldn't maintain. They hadn't slept since the start of the ride, and they were facing a 3,500-foot climb through Sedona and into Flagstaff. We're not, we're not behind schedule. We don't have to be to Flagstaff until for two and a half more hours, so and I think it's only 40 miles away. After 41 hours of almost continuous pedaling, the riders crossed into New Mexico, the land of enchantment, and pulled into a rest stop. Well, we're just going to take a short break. Sue's going to get a massage for a little while, about 15 minutes probably. No sleep though? Well, I am, but I think Sue's not. Okay. okay. We're not wanting to sleep now while we've been on the road for 41 hours because the temperatures are getting colder and they want to get through this section and just get it over with. This should be the last night of really cold weather we have. It'll be warmer in Oklahoma. The warmth of the motorhome provided a half hour of tranquility for Lon and Sue, but then it was time to face the cold once again. The night that lay ahead would prove to be a most challenging one Lon and Sue were to face sub-freezing cold on their way to climbing the 7,200-foot elevation of the Continental Divide. That's the hardest thing to get through is to say, I can wait till dawn and wait till the sun comes up and it'll warm me up. M much like a plant who's freezing in the night, I can wait. And it was really cold. My water bottle had frozen and my feet were, were getting really frozen. I put on big snowmobile mittens so my hands were pretty much okay, but just the wind chill coming down the other side there was about a 12 mile descent or so. And that was, that was really cold, uncomfortably cold. After crossing the Great Divide, Susan and Lon are afforded their first real sleep break, an entire 90 minutes. Next night found them pushing their way through New Mexico. And then, at close to midnight, they passed a fateful spot, just east of Tucumcari, the place where Wayne Phillips had been struck by a reckless motorist the year before, changing an active young life forever. Yeah. Wayne was probably 
the first real long distance cyclist I ever saw, although at the time I didn't uh, realize what an impact he would have on me. Such a terrible thing to happen out here, you know, he's got such a wide shoulder and everything and it's a relatively safe place to ride and to have him behead it intentionally like that, it just kind of makes you wonder. Susan, your thoughts about getting some sleep in a little while? Oh, sounds great. We slept, uh, I guess, about 20 hours ago after riding over the Continental Divide in about 19 degrees. And that was more of just trying to get warm. It really wasn't sleep. So tonight, at least we'll get some sleep before we have to face this headwind again. Tecumseh, Oklahoma marks the halfway point in Lon and Sue's trek across America. After five days on the road, they're an hour behind schedule. With 1,400 miles still to go, 60 minutes doesn't seem like all that much time. Your thoughts? You're halfway through. Uh, you feel better than 83, or you feel so-so? Uh, well, yeah, I, th I definitely feel better because we're almost 18 hours ahead of the, you know, the, the time it took us to get halfway in 83 because I had been so sick on the fourth day. Well, I think we can surprise a lot of people. Um, you know, we would like to see some, some tailwind to wait for this westerly wind for two days now. Um, if we get that, we could easily um, come in in under nine days. The human body forgets the suffering and so you know two months from now I won't remember any of the suffering again I'll just remember the high points the, the goals or the, I don't think the the pain just doesn't stay with you long enough to stop you from doing it again
Sean and Sue had covered 1,550 miles in five days, and they had done it with less than eight hours of sleep. The crew did their best to stay alert and attentive to Lon and Sue's needs, resting when they could, but rarely getting more than three or four hours of sleep at a time. Lon and Sue kept going, and so did the work for the crew. Food preparation turned out to be a round-the-clock job. The riders burned 7,000 to 10,000 calories a day and had to eat every half hour to keep up their energy level. The crew passed them a steady supply of fruits, muffins, cornbread, soup, pita bread sandwiches, macaroni and cheese, nuts, granola bars, vegetables, milkshakes, and even more. The main thing is getting in the calories that are digestible so you can keep going. There is a time sometimes when you're getting really tired and it's just you're tired of chewing. You know, and so you just want foods that, that go down real easy. And I'll eat for my crew because I don't eat for myself because I'm, I'm tired of eating. But if they made it, whether it was brown gush or, or, or white gush, you know, they think it's appetizing and we're going to eat it. And that's, that's why I'm out there is to almost make my body into a machine and just metabolize the energy that I get, make the bike go forward. And that's all I'm supposed to do. It's too bad we don't have hangers. <laughs> Water torture for the shirts and stuff. Lon and Sue changed their clothes daily, so there was always the task of cleaning the laundry. Shopping for supplies kept the crew busy. And the vehicles always needed someone at the wheel. The crew had to deal with a number of inconveniences and plenty of less than pleasant chores. And it seemed that every day, often at the worst possible time, there was the task of keeping the bike in top working order. Most of the work was preventative. The crew mechanic, Chris Peterson, changed the rear tires every 500 miles and the fronts every 1,000. Throughout the trip, there would be only two flat tires. Despite all the hard work, the crew realized they were sharing in a very special experience, sharing the transcontinental ride side by side with Juan and Sue. The crew was excellent, and the mixture of personalities and abilities just worked out uh, great. Even though a lot of the people had never done an event like this before, they just picked it up very quickly, and they were able to keep their intensity for the full event. So with the invaluable help of their support crew, Lon and Sue pressed on. And after traveling 1,840 miles through six states in only six days, Lon and Sue saw the sunrise in eastern Arkansas, lighting their way across the Mississippi River. Crossing the Mississippi River signaled the change of mood for everyone. Lon and Sue and the crew sensed the symbolism of passing the great landmark. Virginia Beach was less than 950 miles ahead, and the end of the crossing was now within Lon and Sue's reach. We were just talking, it's, it's no more than a John Marino Open or a Paris Express Paris now. It's, I mean, those are rides that anyone does, and you know, Lon and I understand that we're not going to have trouble completing it. Yeah, I think the excitement is building. Yeah, I guess the, the, the real problem now is just making sure we finish under 10 days. But the riders weren't easing up at all. Many miles still needed to be conquered, and so did more problems. A Tennessee Highway Patrolman appeared and asked the couple to leave the highway. They had planned to take the next exit anyway, and they continued on. Crew member Victor Gallo, himself an accomplished rider, joined the couple on a Tennessee road, relishing the opportunity. 
first of all, it's an honor to build with them, you know, being so, so distinguished bicyclists themselves. And I'm also a personal friend of them. And secondly, uh, I was getting out of uh, tired of being sitting on that, that motorhome all day. I needed the exercise, and the countryside is beautiful. Sensing the end of the ride was near, other crew members reflected on the trip. I, I think every aspect of the trip, even even when things don't go especially well, is, is something that I enjoy learning from. And so for me, the, the whole trip from, from the start to this point has been an enjoyable experience. I've already started making all sorts of plans of all the riding that I want to do when I get home. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, that the motivation will carry over even after the, the trip is finished. One by one, the remaining miles slipped by, marking the beginning of the end to their cross-country adventure. Highway signs for Virginia Beach began to appear. Most of the time, uh, I'd say, yeah, we got along great. But, you know, there's a, there's a few tense moments where she'd want to plan a stop for a certain time, and I, I wouldn't want to do that, or vice versa. And so there's uh, compromising going on a lot. I'd ask him in the middle of the night, how are you doing? He said, I'm OK, you know, real low. And you just want to look at his face, and then you could tell yeah. you know, if it was time to take the break or if it was time to keep pushing. And I think that that was one thing I, I wish I could have seen, is, is more, more of facial expressions, you know, when the crew did something funny or to see Lon laugh. It was 3 in the morning when a tired and weary Lon and Sue made their way onto the Virginia Beach Pier. There were no cheering crowds or celebrations to greet the couple, who had just set the record for crossing America eclipsing their old mark by a full day. Nine days, 20 hours, and seven minutes before they had started their odyssey. And now, after countless ups and downs, the journey was complete, and its toll had been taken. This event, for sure, encompasses more aspects of my life, you know, socially, financially, um, you know, physically, everything is involved. And, and that'll take about a week or so before I really want to get back into any type of training program. But I think overall this was a, a positive ride. The tandem event was a, was a positive buildup for Race Across America. because. It and my special reward is when you go home and you, you go to a school and you see a globe and you look at it and you can see that you actually went around a curve in the earth. It wasn't flat like we have you know, you'd have to wait for me to shift and it actually say shift Susan. Are you going to shift now? And then I'd look down and try to figure out which control was going to move what. So the race had been run, the record set. Lon and Sue would go back to their home in Harvard, Illinois, and the crew would make their way to their homes. Some going back to Tucson, some to Florida, and others to Illinois. All had been a part of something that would remain with them the rest of their lives. The spring of 1986 and a record crossing of America. For everyone involved in the tandem transcontinental, I'm Brad Steinke. Thanks for being with us.